You'll be finding your place in the Bible. Let's turn to Luke chapter 11 in the Word of God and be finding your place there in the Bible. I appreciate you being here today, and I'm thankful we can assemble ourselves on the Lord's Day in the house of God. What a great thing it is. And uh, I want you to know something, that uh, anywhere I ever go and preach, I still would rather be here as anywhere I've ever been to preach. I want you to know that, and I'm thankful that for this church and and enjoy uh, uh, preaching the Word of God here at Bell Maddox, and I'm glad you've come, and it's a blessing to be here. Uh, I heard something kind of funny I thought I'd share with you. Um, I hate to say share, it sounds liberal, amen? You know, D.L. Moody said, he said, if I thought there was one drop of liberal blood in me, I'd get a blood transfusion, and I would too, amen? And uh, uh, um, you know, most people don't like their name. I heard about a, a lady and she had that kind of unusual name. What happened was her dad's name was Ferdinand, and he married a girl by the name of Liza. And they wanted to, to put both of their names together when they named their daughter, so they named her Fertilizer. Amen? <laughs> How'd you like to have that name, huh? Fertilizer. Amen. I thought that's pretty good. I'll tell that somewhere, and there'll be somebody there with that name. I'll get killed. Amen? Luke chapter 11, open your Bibles, we'll read verse 2 through 4, and I want to preach on a statement from what we consider the Lord's Prayer, and I think technically it would be called the model prayer, design of prayer, um, but I want to lift out uh, about the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we want to preach on today, but if you'll stand with me, we'll begin reading here in verse number 2 of Luke 11, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 2. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, thank you for the Word of God, the privilege to be in your house today, for each one who's come, uh, Lord, uh, that are here in this place, and then those that are joining for the radio service or maybe by the Internet, I pray for them today, and you know the needs of every heart and every, every life. That one who needs a touch today, I pray for the touch of God upon their life. Maybe, uh, Lord, they're uh, here today, and they're sin sick, and they need a touch from you. Or maybe they're sick in body or recovering. They need a touch from you. Uh, God, I don't know what the need might be, but I know you are a God that's able to do far and exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or that we think according to the power that worketh in us. And I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in prayer and that you hear and answer prayer. And so move today in this place and work in hearts and lives. We'll praise you and thank you for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, and you can be saved today. We call this the Lord's Prayer, but it should be called the Model Prayer. Here we recognize who God is to us in this prayer. As you'll notice there in verse 2, when we are to pray, Our Father, that's personal. He is my Father because I've been born into His family. And then we, uh, then we see uh, not only who God is, we see where God is, uh, our Father which art in heaven. And then we notice uh, 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 who He is, how holy God is, hallowed be thy name. Now the translators of our King James Bible capitalized ha uh, hallowed, the word hallowed there, which means a name above every name, a name uh, that cannot be compared with any other name, hallowed be thy name. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. We see what God is going to do. And this is where we'll take our text and preach from today. But notice then, uh, well, we are to pray for our everyday needs. Uh, the kingdom of God has not come yet on this earth. So what are we to do? We are to pray daily. Give us this day our daily bread. And then we are to uh, confess our sins. And we are to forgive others, my friend. Verse 4, and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so we see uh, this great 
what we consider many today in churches, uh, uh, they'll pray this as part of their service. They'll pray the Lord's Prayer. But the problem you have with this is uh, now that uh, uh, many churches have gone to the new versions, do you realize that of the 66 words uh, in, this, uh, in this text, 20 words are omitted in the New Bible versions. Let me read you this scripture in the NIV and show you what they do to it. This is the NIV. I want you to follow along now and you, you follow in your King James Bible and listen to the New International Version. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed with small h, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Sixty-eight words and twenty words are omitted. Uh, by the way, that's just not in the New International Version. That is true of, of at least these many versions, the modern, the modern language Bible, the Living Bible, the Revised Standard Bible, the Catholic Bible, the Good News Bible, the New American Standard, the Contemporary English Version, the New Century Version, and the New World Translation, which is the uh, Bible that was translated by Jehovah Witnesses for Jehovah Witnesses. Now, would you want to trust a, a Bible translated by Jehovah Witnesses for Jehovah Witnesses? But it lines up with the NIV. What about that? Well, I just want you to know that, uh, that, that, that doesn't bother a lot of people, but that bothers me. It bothers me that somebody goes and takes from the Word of God, uh, and God says uh, in Jeremiah, Behold, I am against the prophets that steal my words from his neighbor. God's against this crowd today, friend. I'm telling you it right now. Listen to me. Because they have stolen the Word of God from folks. Well... Let's get into the message today, and that's just the introductory. That sermon's free, okay? Amen? And uh, everybody's looking real good, so we'll go on from there. Praise the Lord. But uh, I want to go back and notice with us today, uh, in verse 2, we want to we deal with and build on this concept today from the prayer that the Lord taught us to pray. We are to pray to God, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in earth. Now what I want to preach on today is what God must do so that His kingdom uh, can be uh, upon this earth. There are some things that must happen for His kingdom to be upon this earth. And we want to deal with those things today. So this will be a prophetic message uh, and I hope it will be a blessing and a help to you. Number one, I want you to write down. Number one, for the Lord to set up His kingdom on this earth. And by the way, I, I am a Bible believer. I'm also a premillennialist. Only premillennialists take the Bible literally. We have many today that believe in, in what's called amillennialism and these other positions of, of, uh, uh, of uh, eschatology, of the second coming of Christ. And did you know that they do not take the Bible literally? They do not take the Bible literally. They do not believe that the kingdom of Christ will be upon this earth. But God's kingdom will be upon this earth. Praise God. And I'm part of it. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Number one, I want you to write this down. For the kingdom of God to be upon this earth, there's some things the Lord must do. And there's some things that must happen. Number one, sin must be brought to a boil. Sin must be brought to a boil. A boil. Now, in uh, Genesis 15, 16, I want to show you an amazing verse of Scripture here. And pray for me today, amen? Genesis 15 and verse 16. 15, 16. Here, the Lord is telling Abraham what is going to happen to his descendants. He tells him that uh, the nation that they are going to be taken, and look, let me go back to verse 13 and get the context here, and I want you to notice a statement in verse 16. The Bible said, God is saying this to Abram, this is before he's given his full name of Abraham, and Brother Mays Jackson used to say that uh, Abram's name was Abram, and when he started tithing, uh, that's when God put the ham on his name. Praise God. You know what? Some of you might get the ham in your life if you start tithing, Amen. Right. You, think you're, you think you're really doing good by not tithing, but what you're really doing is you're missing God's ham in your life is what you're missing out on. 
But that's another sermon. Look at here, verse 13. And he said, God said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and outward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go in to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come forth hither again. Notice this statement, underline it in your Bible. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet what? Full. What about that? Isn't that an amazing statement in the Bible? Now God is saying to Abraham, you're going to be taken, of course we know this is Egypt, you're going to be taken uh, in Egypt 400 years, you're going to be in slavery there 400 years. This was literally fulfilled, exactly fulfilled. It was not to be spiritualized. It happened exactly as God said. And then after that period of time, uh, they would be delivered and they would carry a great substance with them from the land of Egypt. But he makes a statement that is something I want us to think about today. The sin of the Amorites is not yet full. Other words, God says there's this cup of sin and that thing is filling up and it's filling up. But it is not yet full. And when it is full, judgment comes. You know what? Today our world, we are in that place. We are waiting on the sin of the world to come to a head. We're waiting on it to be full today. And so we have... And we have an interesting truth about the iniquity of the Amorites. How many times does the Bible tell us that sin and deception and ungodliness and perversion must come first and then God will step in and deliver us and defeat the forces of evil? You remember in Matthew 24 and verse 5, Jesus said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. What a deceptive age we live in. What a time of false religions and false cults and New Age movement and Islam and all of these things today sweeping our world and people being, uh, 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 my friend, ensnared into deception today. The Bible tells us, in my, I want you to turn to Matthew 24 just for a moment there with me, please. And let's mark some things about the coming time that Jesus said would happen. Not only a time of deception, I want you to notice verse 9 and 10 of Matthew 24. And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And, they, and then shall many be offended and they shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I heard the report today I come, when I was driving to preach. Uh, uh, Brother uh, David Gibbs had a, uh, a broadcast and was talking about in Somalia how that two women were brought forward with their children there. These women, because uh, uh, they thought they might be Christians, it was not proven they were Christians, but because they thought the reason that they said they didn't think they were Christians is they had not been coming to the mosque on Friday and they gathered these two women and they beheaded those women in front of their little girls and their children, watched them as their heads, as they were beheaded publicly for Christ, listen to me, friend, there is more persecution today than in any time we can note in the modern history of the world. Jesus said that there would be great persecution. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 12, notice this statement, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I think we can say amen right there today. We have a lot of coldness today in the church world. Churches today and preachers today are not what they used to be. They're not standing for God once like once stood for God. Churches today have compromised and sold out and have gone worldly and carnal today and building upon sensual things and carnal things. God help us that we would stand for God in these last days. If you'll go with me uh, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, I want you to notice what Jesus, uh, what Paul said here would happen and I believe that we're in that time right now. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, For the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. <clears throat> Are we not in a time when there's unspeakable things happening 
all around our world and all across our country and as though people don't even have a conscience today to do the things that they do. Is it not prophetic? Is it not prophetic? All of the school murders and killings and the theaters and all of the episodes that we hear about, certainly it is prophetic. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and notice verse 3 how the Bible said the condition of the church world. I want you to back up to verse 2. Uh, Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. That means don't change. Be ready. Be ready to preach at the drop of a hat. Amen. I've always said I'll preach at the drop of the hat and drop my own hat. Amen. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come. I believe it's here. I believe it's here. I believe it's here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We are in that time. And the Bible said, if you'll back up to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 3, notice what uh, we have. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a what? A falling away first, uh, and, uh, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And so the, the cup of the Amorites is filling up all the time. The sin of our world is filling up all the time. In Revelation 3, 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. You know what? I, I'm talking about myself today, friend. I had to battle this lukewarmness. Uh, you'll have to battle this lukewarmness today. Iniquity abounds. Uh, and the love of many are waxing cold today. Wait, I want to be red hot when Jesus comes. Amen. That ain't going to happen by accident. That's not going to happen without you and I being very conscious about that and conscientious about that without us having time in the Word of God and praying daily and living by faith and dying to self and serving God and loving souls and being faithful to the house of God. Hey, you better get in today, friend. You know what? Uh, the uh, the uh, fair-weather Christian is just not going to fare well in these days. It's going to be all out for God or I'm afraid you'll not succeed today if you try to halfway serve God. Number one, sin must be bought, brought to a boil. Number two, the saints must be brought to a banquet. Praise God. Now, when sin is at the boiling point, God will judge sin, but he must take his church out first. Isn't that great? Praise God. I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 2 with me this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, we have an interesting statement about the rapture here of the church in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 6. The Bible said, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example of, unto those that should live ungodly. Now did not Jesus say that one of the biblical time periods would be repeated in the last days? Two biblical time periods would be repeated in the last days. As in the days of Noah, and it will be as in the days of Lot. Boy, would say amen. I haven't preached those messages in a while. Uh, but I'll tell you, that's a tremendous study to study both of those biblical time periods and see the many similarities to our day, to the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Now, the days of Lot were days when perversion was not only accepted and practiced, it was promoted and preferred. You know, that's where we are today, folks. We are not just, it's just not that we allow this to go on today. It's not just... If folks want to be in this lifestyle uh, that is so glorified by the world and by Hollywood and by the educational system and everywhere you look today, it's not just that it is accepted today and we've removed the laws from all 50 states. There were laws in every state against sodomy and against this lifestyle. It was criminal activity 50 years ago in all 50 states. If we had all 50 states, maybe, maybe it wasn't all 50 states 50 years ago, I'm not sure. <laughs> 
I think there was. Now we've gone from that to it being preferred and being treated as something wonderful and glorious. Now God said, as in the days of Lot. Now when the cup of sin in Sodom and Gomorrah finally got full, what happened? The fire fell on that place. And they have a hard time today finding exactly where Sodom and Gomorrah was. They think because around the Dead Sea and parts of the Dead Sea, there's evidence of such heat that melted the sand and melted the rocks. They think that is exactly where Sodom and Gomorrah was. It was that the fire was that hot that fell upon that place. Now I want you to notice verse 7 now. Now God sent the fire to Sodom and Gomorrah, but could he do it with Lot still there? No. Can the judgment of God fall upon this world that will fall uh, with the, uh, after the rapture in the day of the Lord? Can that judgment fall upon this world without the church being taken out first? No. Now remember that Enoch is an example of the rapture in the days of Noah. Enoch was not because God took him and uh, he was raptured out. He was taken out and glorified and changed. He had a translation, but the Bible tells us that Noah and his family rode it out in the ark. And that's a picture of the nation Israel who will ride the tribulation, the day of the Lord out, inside the ark. But here we have uh, now the example of Lot. Lot, uh, and notice verse 7, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. By the way, anybody that believes that salvation is any, has anything to do with good works, going to heaven has anything to do with good works, I, I want you to tell me one good work that the Bible recorded that Lot did. Study his life and tell me what good works he did. You'll have a hard time finding any. You say, well, why was he delivered? Because he, he was a child of God and saved, and God would not let him, even though he deserved to burn up with them. God cannot do that. God cannot let us go through the judgment that's coming to this world because we have not been appointed under wrath but we've been appointed unto salvation, praise God. And he's not going to, hey, we are ambassadors for Christ. No nation will begin a war and begin to shell and bomb and attack another nation until first they get their ambassadors home. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be an ambassador to the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, uh, and we will be taken to heaven. And when we go there, we have an appointment, all of us, and have a place, praise God, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, praise God. Hey, the bride, listen to me, friend, not only must sin be brought to a boil, but uh, the saints of God must be brought to a banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hey, man, you're excited about that. I remember when I was a boy, we went one time to Memphis, Tennessee. And I was just like in the ninth grade, I believe. And man, I, and we had this banquet, and I mean, that was that was everything linen, and that was like four or five forks, and three or four spoons, and two or three knives, and they were all kind of glasses and all kind of plates. Every single bite of food you took was on a different plate and with a different fork. Amen. Praise God. Every swallow you took a something to drink, a different glass. I didn't know what. Hey, we all looked at each other. Man, it's neat. I remember one time my wife and I, I worked for a company. They sent us over to Hawaii, a big fancy thing. And here come this little guy, and he began to put something in my lap. I almost busted him in the mouth. Amen, praise God. She said, no, they do that. They do that. I said, hey, they don't do it to me. Amen. Are you kidding? God. I hadn't been around that. I hadn't been around that. You listen to We're country people. We're country people. We're going to a city, friend. And we're going to a banquet. It's out of this world, praise God. Oh, yes. I want you to go to Revelation 19. I want you to notice this banquet here. There's two banquets here. 
My question for you today is this. Which banquet do you have arrangements to be at? Which banquet do you have arrangements to be at? You've got to make arrangements to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You don't have to make any arrangements to be at the great supper, uh, the supper of the great God. You don't have to make any arrangements to that. That'll happen automatically if you don't make arrangements to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice with me, Revelation 19. I want you to notice verse 7. The Bible said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Who's His bride, church? Who's his bride? We are, hallelujah, amen. We're his bride. The marriage has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. Bless it. Hey, listen, friend. Have you made arrangements to be at that banquet? Do you have a place there? I believe when we get saved by the grace of God, a place is set. Amen. And as far as I can tell, they've never took up any places. Come on. Wouldn't heaven be in disarray today if it was built like some folks believe and they would set that place and then they would look at us and from heaven and say, whew, man, I'll tell you what, now, that, that William, yeah, Dewey Williams ain't going to make it. Just take his place up. And then do a little better and get right, you know, and stuff. Well, go ahead and put it back. Looks like he might make it. And then, no, take it up, take it up, take it up. You think that heaven's like that? God's not in that kind of disorder. Now, I want you to notice, please, in verse 18, I mean, verse 17, we have another marriage. We have another supper. You've got to make preparation. You have to prepare to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You do that by getting saved. You do that by repenting, coming to Jesus, a poor lost sinner, trusting Him, repenting of your sin, getting washed in the blood, and getting your name in the Lamb's book of life, and getting a place at that marriage supper. There's one group of Baptists that believe they're the only ones that's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're called brighter Baptists. Baptist Briders. One man said, he was preaching to a friend of mine. He said, John Wesley won't be at the marriage supper. He said, yeah, he will. I'm giving him my seat, bless God. That's what a preacher said. Some of that kind of stuff is ridiculous. Amen. I, I am a Baptist, but I do not adhere to any tradition. If it is not biblical and scriptural, I'll tell you, you can keep it. Amen. I don't care what it is. I want to follow the Word of God. I want to follow the Bible. Now, I want you to notice here that verse number 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and of the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. I got news for the beast. I got news for the kings of the earth. I've got news for the armies that gather against him. They're going down. They, God, the Lord Jesus is going to melt them like a salted slag. And they are not going to be at a supper they are going to be the supper. Now, I'll tell you right now, I don't want to be involved in that supper. Praise God. I've made arrangements to miss that. And my question to you today, have you? You're listening by TV, radio, internet, it doesn't matter. The message, you're hearing the message on YouTube. How, I thank God for every avenue we have getting the Word of God out today. And the message is always, have you made preparation to miss the Supper of the Great God. You can do that today, right now, wherever you might be. You don't have to be in a church to be saved. You don't have to find a priest or, or some certain person. No, sir, 
my friend, you can humble yourself before God today in, in humility and uh, sincerity. And the Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm glad of that, amen. What a wonderful God we have who loves to save sinners. Number three, not only must sin be brought to a boil, the saints must be brought to a banquet. Number three, Zion, and I spelled it with an S for my alliteration, must be brought back to their boundary. Now, Jesus said, my kingdom is going to be on earth. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, we'll just specialize that and say that's talking about the church. Let's not talk about the church, friend. Because you can't tell me the world, the mess this world's in, that that's God's will and that God's kingdom has ever been established on this earth. It hasn't come close. Some amillennial people say, when it, we, we'll look at just in a moment how Satan was chained with the chain. And they say, well, uh, he got chained back, he, he was chained thousands of years ago. If he was chained thousands of years ago, it's one of two things about that. It was either a real long chain or he was chained to me. That's ridiculous. Israel will be back in the land. Now, we've watched this happen. Jesus told us, I want to show you some scriptures real quick. Our time's getting gone. Matthew, go back to Matthew chapter 19. Now, in Matthew 24, remember, Jesus told us that we are to watch the fig tree. Is that right? Matthew 24 and verse 32. But I want you to back up to Matthew 19 and verse 18. I want to show you something interesting here. Matthew 19, verse 18. Would you notice here? Let me find the scripture. All right, hold on here. All right, we'll find it. Okay. I'm sorry, chapter 21. Got the wrong chapter. Matthew 21, Matthew 21 and verse 19. Matthew 21, verse 19. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a what? A fig tree. Now underline it, mark that. In the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig, the fig tree withered away. Now, I want you to, if you want a, a trivial point on, on the Bible, someone would ask you, what is the only negative miracle our Lord and Savior did in His earthly ministry? Here it is. This is the only negative miracle we know of that He did. Every time else He was healing somebody, He was delivering somebody, but here He cursed the fig tree and instantly it withered and drew it. Now, in Matthew 24 now, notice verse 32 that we'll have an interesting statement. Now, that fig tree represents the nation Israel in the Bible. So there's a period of time that the nation of Israel did not exist. 2,000 years from 70 A.D. until May 1948, there was not a nation of Israel upon this earth. The Jewish people were dispersed throughout the world. They maintained their identity. They maintained their uh, bloodlines and their religion. And for almost 2,000 years of human history, the fig tree was withered and it did not exist. But yet the Lord tells us in Matthew 24 and verse 32, look at this now, we learn that now learn a parable of the fig tree when its branches is, is yet tender and put it forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh, so likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. We find that the Lord tells us to watch the tree, the fig tree. I noticed something about the fig tree that had been withered earlier is now doing what? You see this? What is it doing? Come on church, help me a little bit. What is this fig tree doing? It is putting forth leaves. It is and the Bible said, when you see this, 
you know that it is near even at the doors. This is why we are living in such a unique time in human history. We're living in a time when the uh, nation Israel has been restored. And in 1967, they took control of Jerusalem. That's key to Bible prophecy. We see the tree. And in Israel today, it's blooming. They're producing fruit. Uh, there's amazing things happening in Israel. Every time I get publications about uh, the nation Israel, they talk about new inventions that just invented in Israel. I read just last week. They invented, they, they came up with a way for folks that have been getting uh, gastric bypass surgeries. They have come up with a sleeve that they can put in you without surgery that will do the same thing for people to help them on their way. Israel's developing. Israel invented a pill you swallow if they, so they can look at your small intestines. And, go through. and if we ta start talking about the inventions that come from Israel that have benefited the entire world, we wouldn't have enough time if we stayed here all day talking about those things. What a blessing they've been. The tree is blooming today. Now, the, uh, Israel has to be back in the land. Remember that Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 37 he went out and saw the valley of dry bones. And God said, prophesy to these bones, son of man. Can these bones live? Thou knowest, Lord God. And the bones started coming together. You remember the old spiritual song? Them bones and bones and dry bones. Uh, you remember, how many remember that old song? Amen. And the, and the bone connected to the hip bone and all, and all through the body. And he used to sing that. That's taken from Ezekiel chapter 37. And God said, and, and so that there would be no question what it is. He said in verse 11, These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off for our, uh, for our, uh, from our part. I'm telling you, God is raising us. God's done a miracle, my friend. Now, Isaiah 66 and verse 8. Very key verse. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Oh my, I'll tell you every time I read about the history of modern Israel, it is so thrilling and so amazing. There's so much intrigue. It's so, such an amazing thing. They met over there and they got together. England pulled out of Palestine and here was 50 million Arabs around them that all swore to destroy 600,000 Jews that had gathered and they met uh, in their parliament and they decided by just something, just by just a, maybe a couple vote majority that they would declare their independence. Uh, they'd raise the flag of David over that little land. Uh, and when they did, uh, Harry Truman sent word and recognized them and said, we recognize uh, the nation Israel. And I want you to know, then immediately they were attacked by all their enemies. No way, no way. Hey, all of the military men around the world that gathered, uh, Harry Truman's uh, uh, the men that fought in World War II, such as uh, 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 Marshall and, and those men like that, and, and Eisenhower, those men that talked to him said, Israel cannot survive a week. They can't make it one week. It would be impossible for them. They'll be annihilated. But they voted to go their independence without an army, without weapons, without bullets, without tanks without planes, those folks that spoke many languages, they fell on the firing line and they began to fight the Arabs and fought them to a standstill until the Arab nations uh, had sued for peace. And I want you to know as a God in heaven, a nation was born in one day and the kingdom of God will be on this earth. But it can't be on this earth until the Jews are in their land. Praise God. Let's go to the fourth thing. Sin must be brought to a boil. The saints must be brought to a banquet. Zion must be brought to their boundary. Number four, sinners must be brought to brokenness. Now, the world right now is working hard to bring in their utopia. One world government, one world church, one world economy, everything global. Our schools right here, and you'll see sometime this little saying, Work locally, think, think globally. How many of you have heard that? How many of you have heard that statement? Work locally, 
think globally. You say, what's that do for you, Brother Dewey? I get nauseated, amen? So, so Appalachian Americans here in this part of the country say it makes me want to vomit, amen? But you know what? God will break and burn it all up. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had his dream of those world empires, Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome and how Rome would be revived in the last days and all the elements of that one world government would be in the one world uh, government in the last days. But I want you to know it didn't end there, friend. No, he saw a stone cut out of a mountain without hands uh, and he smashed that statue and it ground it to powder and it was scattered upon all the earth and it was no more. I want you to know every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. You know how many times that statement is in the Bible? Three times. Do you know that? Isaiah 45, 23, Romans 14, 11, and Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. This world, every sinner, every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Number five, and I'll close here. I know time gets gone. Not only will sin come to, must be brought to a boil, the saints must be brought to a banquet. Zion must be brought to her boundaries. Sinners must be brought to brokenness. Number five, write this down. Satan must be brought to being bound. Now, Revelation chapter 20, turn there, and, and I'm through, and just be a minute. Praise God. Oh, I love prophecy. I love it, amen. I love it. I may not have it all right, but I got a lot of it right. Amen. Romans chapter 20, look at this. Look at what happened, verse 1 and 2. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And what? Bound him, what? Thousand years, woo! Maze Jackson said, when I was a boy, we, he lived in Henderson, North Carolina. And he said, we went to Saluda and played them in basketball. And it used to be years ago, there's a lot of fist fights. We don't have fist fights anymore. We just kill each other now, amen? They used to. They'd fist fight instead of shoot people. They got in a big fight over there in that ball game. Brother May said they took our coach and put him in a little one-room jailhouse and slewed him. And he said the whole town got around that jailhouse and was singing all night long. He's in the jailhouse now. <laughs> Brother May said, Mister, I look for that day when a mighty angel comes out of heaven with a chain and chains the devil in the pit for a thousand years and mister we'll get around the, uh, the portal of hell and we'll sing he's in the jailhouse now amen hey I got news for you he's not in the jailhouse now he's the prince in the power of the air he's the spirit that worketh uh, in the children of disobedience the Bible said be sober be vigilant because your devil because your adversary the devil's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour He's loose as he can be, working as hard as he can work, doing everything he can do against God. But he knows his time is short. And I got something else to tell the devil today. I'm on the winning side. He is not going to win. He is not going to prevail. God will win supreme. Well, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is going to do this. And I've got a question for us. Bow our heads today as we come to the invitation time. Come on, brother. J.C.